Everybody, welcome to our next webinar. It's a pleasure and honor to bring to you a dear friend of mine, Pascal Finette. Pascal, a pleasure to have you here. So good to be here. Yeah, so those of you who are members of our Singular University community know Pascal for all the incredible programs that you've run over the years, heading our entrepreneurship. Let me do a, an appropriate uh, interview uh, and uh, introduction for our interview here. So Pascal is the co-founder at Radical Ventures and Singular University's Chair of Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation. He got started on the net before there was a web browser. Do we actually, I'm, did we have I that? am literally that old, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, founded a series of technology startups and was an early employee at eBay, at Mozilla, and at Google.org. Uh, most recently, he built you know, Singular University's startup program, including SU's Accelerator and Venture Fund, and thank you for that amazing work. Of course. Uh, further, he founded the nonprofit organization's Mentor for Good and the Coaching Fellowship. Um, he's focused on, uh, on helping really change the world of entrepreneurship. Uh, you have a newsletter called The Heretic, uh, which is read by tens of thousands of change makers globally. So Pascal, uh, super excited uh, to really continue the conversation that you've started with so many SU grads, uh, with our Abundance Digital community, and, uh, and thank you for coming down to our studios here at XPRIZE. Thanks for having uh, me. For, uh, for the day. Uh, so uh, let me begin by asking you what are you most excited about these days? <laughs> so many things, right? Yeah. I mean, all the things you talk about in terms of like the, the world really shifting to an abundant world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, us allowing, uh, this allowing us to build really new types of companies. So I'm really interested in, for me personally, the work is really, uh, what I get in, excited about is how do businesses and their business models shift in this new world? Mm -hmm. um, because we see, of course, many new business models emerge. And for me, the fascinating question is less the, the ground truth, right? Like uh, ground truth for me is uh, we're moving to subscription models or you move to software as a service models um, or as a service models. I'm much more interested in like, what is the, um, the 15,000 feet view? Not like, you know, like the, the very uh, extrapolated view, 30,000 feet, what happens macroeconomically. There's a lot which changes there, of course, as well. But really, what does it actually mean on, a strategy, on the strategy side for a company? Mm. And particularly interested in what does it mean for uh, what you would call SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses, because yeah. you know, they're the backbone of, of our economy. And it's interesting, right? Because the challenge is the rate of change is so fast mm. that when you're starting a company, I remember one of the stories I wrote about, I think, in Abundance, when I met the founders of uh, Siri, um, they, when they started Siri, they projected where the tech would be in three years. And they built the product to intercept sort of bandwidth processing speed and natural language processing. And it, it really hit me that if they, they said if they had built the product for what the technology existed at the time when they started, by the time they delivered it would have been out of date. 100%. And that's also true for business models too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think what's fascinating to, to think about is um, <clears throat> so one advantage you have today as, as, a, as a company, as a small, particularly as a smaller company, is you can actually, um, you're not building a lot of this stuff, right? Like you're making bets on like um, outsourced services, which allows you to really focus on where's the value creation for you and your customer. Um, so if you make the right smart bets, you can actually um, not worry yourself with like where's technology going to be uh, in particular fields, right? But you can really think about like, where is my customer and their problem going to be in particular field uh, in three to five to 10 years and focus on the value creation there and basically have all the other stuff being taken care of by many, many uh, what we call infrastructure companies. Interesting, because <clears throat> if you think about it, uh, you, don't, you don't worry that Google is not providing you the best searches, right? Use Google for your search engine and just assume that they're going to be improving their software all the time versus if you had built it as a part of what you needed to do, you'd have to be improving it. That's so right. the more you can outsource to, as you call, infrastructure companies, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're killing themselves to provide the best product and maintain your business. Absolutely. And you could just assume that you're always riding on top of the best available capabilities. Yeah. And, and, and focus on your brand, focus on your customer. And yeah. you know what I find really fascinating in, in all the research we're doing in this field at the moment is, so this was true for software for quite a long time. Um, so a good example is, of course, um, 
There were once three engineers. They took 552 days uh, to create a company which was used by 30 million people, sold it to Facebook for a billion uh, dollars, which of course is Instagram. Yeah. They didn't need to write any of the software, right? Like all these three engineers wrote was the photo filters and the sharing software. Um, they didn't write the camera software, they didn't write the operating system, right? Android or iOS. That was all given to them. And as you say, rightfully, the companies underneath that, right, the Apples and the, uh, the Googles of this world, they keep, kept pushing this forward. So you could just write uh, and focus on the value creation of your particular product. But now we're seeing it also in physical goods, which is really fascinating. So That's think about... Fa it is fascinating. Right, right? Think about, um, there's a good example in my world, which is, um, you think Casper. Mm -hmm. So Casper is this company which makes basically one product. It's a mattress. Um, the genius they had was that they saw that if you take a, a foam mattress, you suck the air out, it becomes so small that you can actually roll it and then put it into a box and ship it with like normal shipping ways, right? So they disrupt the industry. Um, Casper is four years old. Uh, they're making $400 million in revenue, have 600 employees, uh, have a valuation of 1.1 billion US dollars, making so, so a mattress. I'm just going to pause one second because that is insane. Right. Right. A single, I mean, who, if, if you would, if you would, if you're an investor, an entrepreneur and someone said, listen, I'm going to make a mattress and that's all I'm going to make and I'm going to try and get to a billion dollar valuation in four years, uh, that would sound crazy. It does, right? And the, the interesting thing is, uh, Casper doesn't even manufacture the mattress, right? They don't ship it, they don't warehouse it, all that is outsourced, right? And they outsource it again, they, they outsource it to partners who will do their own to keep up with tech. So the, the, every partner is, is committed to being the very best, so there's continuous improvement process, right. even though Casper is not driving it or requiring it. Mm -hmm. and, and so what does Casper do? So mostly what they're doing is uh, product development, as in rethinking the product, uh, marketing, uh, which makes them uh, really good, brand management, and customer support. Right? The same is true for, uh, there's a beautiful example here in the US again, um, there's a shoe company called Allbirds, um, which is like the Instagram darling, basically. Um, Three-year-old company, they service a million customers by now, uh, hmm. make $100 million in revenue, 200 employees, right? Same deal. They don't manufacture anything, they don't warehouse it, they don't ship it. All they're doing is you know, social media marketing, which they're really good at, they create a great brand around it uh, and have a valuation of $1.4 billion, which I find so interesting um, because we are now seeing, you know, like physical good companies uh, basically by leveraging the techniques software companies have pioneered, now getting into the same valuation game. So is it an exact duplicate? So Allbird as well, it's brand management and marketing mm -hmm. and product, product vision. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there anything else these companies are, are doing? Not much, actually, and it seems to be enough. Um, and so as long as you can assemble the stack mm -hmm. of the components for it and fulfillment and such, then it allows you to go from, I mean, and also they're, they're almost infinitely scalable, right? right? Because if you pick the right suppliers, those yep. suppliers can go zero to 100 instead of just zero to one. Yep. One thing though is, uh, and our research shows this, is um, there is a little bit of a natural um, barrier to the scale, which is this. Um, these companies tend to be specialized products for specialized customers. So they go into a very specific niche. Um, so for example, Allbirds um, caters to, you know, like the millennial, the style conscious, affluent millennial basically mm -hmm. in, in urban centers. Um, that limits them, of course, in their growth to a certain extent. So they can penetrate that market, they can go into that market, but there's a certain limitation in their growth. What we see these companies do now as a uh, next step is they tend to, yes, they grow their, their product offering a little bit. So Allbirds just introduced socks, right? So make kind of makes sense. You sell shoes, you sell socks, it makes sense. Right, yeah, right. adjacencies. Right. Uh, Casper sells you uh, pillows, right? Um, but much more fascinating for us is that we are now seeing companies which take their model and replicate the model into other industries. So a good example is um, Method. Uh, Method makes cleaning products, you know, like dishwashing, liquid, etc. Their big um, kind of like claim to fame was they put them into really beautifully packaged um, product packaging, mm -hmm. meaning that you're actually proud to show off your dishwashing liquid on your, on your uh, shelf instead of like hiding it under the counter. Um, they became pretty big, but with that brand, you can only do so much, right? You can only do like, you know, washing liquid. They took the learnings from this and applied it to the vitamin and mineral market and started a company called Oli. 
So they took the same insight, which is if you buy vitamins or minerals as a supplement, they often look like you have a disease, right? They, like, I mean, seriously, <laughs> they look like they come in these like bottles with like the prescription stuff on it, right? And you put them on your shelf and people are like, man, are you sick, you know? <laughs> and what they did is they created beautiful packaging around it. And the other th interesting thing is they, they found like people don't like taking tablets, uh, particularly for stuff like which is non-medical. So they wrapped this stuff into little gummy bears, right? So basically you eat gummy bears. Um, it's beautifully packaged, so you put it on a shelf and people are fine with it. So it's fascinating to see these companies replicating themselves into other industries to get to scale. Incredible. So one of the things that, uh, that I have felt for a while is that economics today is very broken. Mm -hmm. uh, the classical economic indicators and, and, and reporting structures are don't account for any of the sharing economy, don't care, account for the fact that you know, on your device here, you've got millions of dollars of free stuff. So I, uh, you mentioned to me that your, your next book here is gonna be in the area of economics. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, and I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, it goes from anything from like how broken GD, uh, measuring GDP is, yeah. right, as a, as, a, um, as a measure of like an economics output, um, all the way down to um, things uh, which are much more fundamental in its economic structure. So there's a good example um, we found for our book. So in our book, we're looking at how do markets what do you, shift? What, do you, what are you calling the book right now? So the, the we'll, working we'll promote it to you once it's available. That's but awesome, yeah. yeah. So the, book, the, the working title is Hourglass Economics. And yeah. the, the main premise of the book is this. <coughs> in most markets, particularly consumer markets, um, for the last 40 years, what we've seen is what is called the product pyramid. Product pyramid is basically you have a high margin, low volume product at the top. Typically, these were luxury goods. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the exact opposite at the bottom. And what now happens is that we're seeing this, this pyramid shifting more towards an hourglass shape. Yeah. The top gets bigger, the bottom gets bigger, the stuff in the middle starts to disappear. Um, good example in fashion is um, you have all birds growing at the top, you know, specialized product for a specialized customer. Um, you have um, Primark. H&M, Zara, so fast fashion growing at the bottom. And you've got the gap basically disappearing. Mm. And the gap, the whole reason for existence was they gave you a good product at a fair price. Yeah. Now the challenge is, because of all the things you know, we are talking about, you are talking about, for example, production has become so much better that you now get better product quality at much lower prices, right? You can walk into Uniglo buy a $5, $10 t-shirt. I guarantee you, we'll have this t-shirt for 10 years, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't fall apart anymore. Um, which is interesting because again, in GDP, for example, we don't measure this, right? We don't measure the fact that the stuff you put in your, uh, in your shelves, uh, the stuff you have at home now lasts forever, yeah. right? So it's fascinating uh, to, to think about this from a macroeconomic perspective. But if you look at it on a company's perspective, on a business model perspective, if you have a $10 t-shirt, why would you buy a $25 t-shirt from The Gap, which, you know, the brand you probably don't care all that much about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have yet to find someone who's like saying, I'm a proud Gap. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, they might be out there. Um, so what people tend to do is they tend to either buy the $10 t-shirt or they buy the $100 t-shirt, which has a, you know, there's a brand story behind it and so on. And, and in fact, the fact that it's $100 is part of the meaningful story. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, let's talk about brand because uh, I'm super fascinated by will brand survive mm -hmm. and will brand be meaningful? Um, you know, part of this conversation in my mind is that a lot of the purpose of brand is for someone to show an affiliation or to show their wealth, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to buy a Louis Vuitton bag because I can afford it. What it where's brand going? Absolutely. So uh, in my world, uh, brand used to be about signaling exactly what you just described, yeah. um, as well as trust, right? Like you buy um, a Louis Vuitton handbag to signal, but you also trust that it's of great quality. Yeah. Trust is going away, right? We don't need trust anymore because- um, well, We don't need trust by the brand. Correct. We can get trust from other places. Correct. Because now we have, uh, say for example, in the hotel industry, you needed to, like you went to marry it because you trust them that the, that the hotel is great. No, you, you just go on TripAdvisor, you can find out, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to trust the brand In fact, anymore. you can find a, a narrow niche, you know, uh, specialized hotel that is amazing, Absolutely. but you would have never trusted, you know, you know Pigeon by the Sea as a name of a... Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly, that's it, right? So brands, uh, in my world, brands actually still matter 
but they really matter around the signaling component. So that becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And it actually shows because um, you take, for example, uh, there's a company called Patagonia and there's a company called North Face. They make the, basically the same product, which is you know out, outdoor gear, etc. I would postulate the quality of the product is equal, but one company, Patagonia, because they have a really strong brand, they have a meaning behind the brand, there's a social movement around the brand, make significantly more money mm. on their products, right? Like we pay premium for it. Whereas North Face, like they don't stand for a lot. Mm. So the signaling goes down, meaning we can we can make less money on it. And it's interesting going back to Allbird and uh, and Casper. Uh, their their value add is ultimately their marketing and their brand. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the things that you know in in entrepreneurs uh, advising entrepreneurs, which we both do. Is, is getting clarity about what is your brand in the most concise, focused area. Mm -hmm. And companies that go after way too many products and way too many things have a reduced brand valuation. And, and you're not, you don't actually see the huge value that, you, that you're getting in brand in, in Casper and Allbirds. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to add to something you talk quite a bit about, um, of course, which is um, the massive transformative purpose. Yeah. Right, brands actually need to have a purpose, yeah. right? Um, so you need to, uh, and again, like Patagonia is a beautiful example for this, where we really affiliate ourselves with Patagonia and what they stand for, and they're kind of like, to a certain extent, they're a social movement, right? Like protecting the, the uh, environment and the wildlife, et cetera. Um, so brands matter a lot, but you need to be, uh, brands also need to stand for something. And then yep. you can't just stand for something, you actually need to take the action towards it. Yep. It, it can't just be words. It have to, has to be backed up by, by demonstrated value that people right. see. Um, so, uh, trust. Let's talk about trust a little bit, a little bit more. You, you know, one of the things you mentioned to me earlier was this idea of the Amazon four-star yeah. store. So, what, what's that mean? And, yeah, yeah. And what, and, and, <clears throat> yeah. So then. the Amazon Four Star Store, uh, which they have one in, uh, in New York City, um, I visited recently, is a really interesting concept because it turns retailing on its head. What the Four Star Store does is, so it's an Amazon physical store mm -hmm. where every single product in the store was rated by Amazon uh, buyers at and four and, stars. And therefore millions of people. Millions of people, that's the whole point, right? Yeah. Four stars or above. What this creates is this, first of all, is a very weird hodgepodge of products in there, like literally anything, like from cooking, ut cooking utensils to books to electronics. But you walk in the store and it happened to me, you trust, inherently trust that every single product on the shelf is good, right? Because you don't need to trust the brand anymore, you trust the reviews. Hmm. Um, now, Amazon has curated those reviews for you by basically saying we only put products which have good reviews on these shelves, meaning, I literally, I walked in this store, I needed uh, some cooking utensils we needed to buy for friends. I just grabbed the stuff off the shelf. I don't look at the brand anymore. I don't care about the brand anymore, right? Like some were from OXO, some were from different kind. I don't care, right. right? It shifts, it's really fascinating because it shifts the brand power away from the individual brand all the way up to Amazon because the only person I need to trust is that Amazon doesn't screw me over with the four star re reviews, right? So as long as I trust Amazon, I can just buy anything in that store. Amazing. And it's crazy, yeah, it's crazy because it demonstrates like you only have two types of com companies, right, in terms of brands. Either Allbirds or, you know, Patagonia or something, I deeply care about them, I'm a right. fanboy, or I trust the intermediary who gives me the, the who uh, basically aggregates trust. Mm -hmm. And then if you think about what the blockchain might do in the future, you probably can get rid of the intermediary completely and just trust the blockchain. Yeah, uh, in incredible. It, it's, um and so it's interesting, right? Because a lot of, of what has gone on in the past is a company builds its brand, protects its brand uh, as its most valuable asset. Mm -hmm. I think of Coca-Cola as an example. Um, and then there's the use of influencers mm -hmm. who have an individual brand. Uh, you know, influencer is a is a brand, and then by affiliation with that product, that influencer is is sharing trust with their brand. Absolutely. Yeah. But this, this plus this is interesting idea of, uh, we talked about economics earlier, right? So just to show you how pro broken economics, I believe, is today. Um, in 1970, George Akerlof won the Nobel Prize for something called the Theory of Lemons. Theory of Lemons basically says that 
the seller of a product knows more than the buyer of a product. Mm -hmm. And the uh, example he gave is uh, used cars, right? Like the used car salesman knows more about all the defects the car has. And what he showed is that as a rational human being, you know that. So you assume that the car is actually worse than what the seller tells you it is, right? Because the seller has an incentive so to about, hide. We're talking about lemons like car lemons. Car not, lemons. Not, not, yeah, no, not, no, not physical lemons, lemons right? <laughs> okay. So what happens then over time is that because you bid the lowest price, the seller will offer you over time worse cars because they can't make quite as much margin. So what Ekolov showed that in the 70s, basically every car you bought used was broken and terrible. Um, that led to new business models like um, certified pre-owned, uh, where you go to a dealership and they basically certify the car. Or you have a company like CarMax, which became massive, selling you used cars with a warranty. Um, I believe you can literally like, take that uh, Nobel Prize, print mm -hmm. it out, and rip it apart. Because it's not true anymore. Like We now know as a buyer, like we know as much about the product as the seller, right? Like you just go online, you find everything. It totally shifts the power and the market dynamics in, the, in this market, and it benefits um, newcomers. Right. And, and so it allows you, uh, through transparency and, and data, mm -hmm. to, uh, to be able to put forward a, a product uh, that is new in the market by a small player and still have, have it valued as unique and, 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 uh, and meaningful by the buyer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's, let's jump into uh, a, something that I'm fascinated by, which goes back to what allows a company like Casper and a company like Allbird to exist, which is this notion of the term you use is infrastructure providers. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, and and I, I think about this. I have a slide that talks about the pro, the cost of starting a internet-based startup today <laughs> versus what it was just at the top of the dot-com bubble in 2000, yep. right? And so. Back in 2000, if I wanted to create an internet startup to sell things, like I was just talking to Bill Gross, who started eToys, I would need to get so much. I, I mean, it was like $5 million to get to a basic startup, yep. right? It was like I had to buy the server, I had to buy the bandwidth, I had to buy the software, I had to, you know. But now, you can literally start a company mm -hmm. uh, with minimal dollars. Uh, and have massive scale and ride on this product improvement curve. So let's begin by define what you consider an infrastructure provider. And if you're thinking about starting a, a company, uh, if you're an entrepreneur, if, or if you're, if you're running a company and you're not using infrastructure providers, uh, our friend Salim Ismail talks about this of being an exponential organization, right? Being an EXO, which means being as nimble as you possibly can, yep. being untethered to assets and capabilities that you inherently had to build and then have to maintain. So, um, so part of using infrastructure providers across the board uh, is being an exponential organization, being a nimble organization. So I want to dive into this a little bit because I'm fascinated by it and I'd like to create a list that you can write down and I'm going to actually, uh, I think one of the things I want to do is, is create the most definitive list <laughs> of uh, entrepreneurial infrastructure providers yep. and who they are and, and who's doing what. So let's what, define an infrastructure provider for me. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, this comes basically comes out of the software industry. Um, what we've seen in the software industry for the last, what, like 60 years is basically when we started with software way back when, you needed to write everything, right? Like you wrote your own operating system and then you built your software on top of this. And over time, basically, this amount of stuff you needed to do has become much, much smaller, right? So nobody writes their own operating system anymore. You don't write your own database system anymore. You don't write your application server anymore. Um, and that leads uh, to tie this back to what we talked about with Instagram, right? Leads to a world where like three engineers can build this company. Um, now we're seeing this reflected in non-tech industries as well. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, of course, we know this, for example, in logistics. Like you would never dream of like running your own UPS or FedEx or USPS, right? Like you would never. Um, so we've been doing that for a long time, mm -hmm. but now we're doing it kind of everywhere. Um, so anything from all your back office stuff, right? Like so your accounting, your hiring, your payroll processing um, to the way you sell product uh, online and offline, right? So anything from your payment provider to your shop provider, et cetera. Mm. Again, like you don't build any of that stuff anymore. What you do is you pick the best 
possible solutions for your particular use case, you combine them in interesting ways. Um, you talk a lot about convergence, yep. right? Like in some ways, this is also a form of convergence for me. So we, we, we converge these things together and then you really just focus on what is it you do which nobody else can do? Yeah, so I mean, it is fascinating. It's basically building a stack mm -hmm. in which you're providing the very top layer mm -hmm. and building on top of everybody else. And now, part of it is, can you be competitive in that? Can, mm -hmm. you know, can, how do you, how do you not have someone build the exact same stack yep. and go directly into competition with you? So, I'm curious about your thought there, and then I'd like to actually if, again, for maximal utility, let's talk about some of these uh, different companies there, at least the ones that you're excited absolutely. about. Yeah, so, absolutely, yeah, So how do you, how do you maintain uh, uniqueness and um, competitive advantage when you're building on top of a, a stack that's open to everybody? Yeah, I think it goes back to, um, so if you think about product development, product development over the last couple of years, um, probably last decades or so, has really shifted and it's still not there yet, but it has really shifted towards a um, market-driven approach, right? Mm -hmm. Like the question we are asking is, what is the problem we are solving for the customer? Mm -hmm. If you s solve that problem for your customers in the way the customer wants it, I would not worry about someone else copying you. Interesting. Um, because again, like the, the, the focus you should have is outward, not inward. Um, back in the day, we were all very inward focused because we needed to build all this damn stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so you spend a lot of like your brain power on figuring out how do you set up a server? How do you like, you know, what does your checkout process look like? Now you're like, eh, whatever, we just like slap on Stripe and you're done, right? Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. One thing I just want to make a note of yeah. is for everybody who's um, in the business of already running a business, right? So namely um, a legacy business and or an incumbent business, what we find for a lot of these businesses is they own too much of the stack. Yep. Like traditionally, you know, like they run their own warehouse when they shouldn't. They run their own manufacturing when they shouldn't. Um, they have an IT guy who programmed their own website when you shouldn't. Mm. All these kind of factors. So um, there's a really important piece in there uh, as a key learning, I think, for the community out there. Also that if you are in an existing business, figure out like which of this, like of the stack you should be running yourself where you're actually competitive to the market and where do you better outsource? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because there is such a resistance to change. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is if someone comes in, you know, for goodness sakes, there have been hundreds of mattress brands, yep. right? And mattress stores. Absolutely. And, and why didn't they create what Casper created, mm -hmm. right? Why didn't Kodak create what Instagram created? Because we defend our position, we don't question it. Yeah. And as soon as we start defending our position, no, we need to control that. Um, you put yourself up for a lot of pain. And so that's a really great point of, you know, one of the things you can do and probably should do is have some, some uh, you know, a team, a black ops team or whoever yep. it is, come in and evaluate your stack yep. and look at how you can reduce your cost, increase your agility, uh, reduce your overhead of employee base, all of that. That's amazing. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I think there's a, uh, uh, in a different context, we talk about these, like the, what we call the four horsemen, um, which lead to disruption. It's basically like the, the things companies trip up over. And what, one, what are the four horsemen? Yeah, so one of them is actually what you just described, which is this notion that it's subtle, but it's very dangerous. We call this the leverage what you have problem, mm -hmm. which is um, if you are an incumbent company, you have, let's say, a factory. You've got some CapEx and OpEx deployed somewhere. Um, there's a very strong tendency for you to use it, right, because it's there. Um, yeah. The best example for me is always uh, when uh, the last 10, 20 years, when we had this shift towards the cloud, I saw a lot of companies um, who had data centers and they said, well, we have a data center, so we better use it, right? Like we just invested, I don't know, like we bought servers for a million dollars. So like we can't do this Amazon thing because we just bought servers for a million dollars. Yeah. But you put up yourself for a lot of pain because you're putting yourself at a competitive disadvantage, yeah. right, to someone it, who it, doesn't it, have that. And, and and stopping that, the psychology of saying I was wrong right. and I have to switch is so difficult. Oh, of course. The equivalent I think about, we just had, I uh, uh, spent some time with Hermes Nam recently, is you know, the, the energy facility that has to shut down their coal plant to set up a solar facility. Yep. Right? And it's, it's totally. cheaper to install new solar than to keep running your coal plant. And that analysis is, is clearly going to be happening here yep. because the scale 
of AWS and the software tools right. on top of AWS, depend, you know, compared to your own your own data centers, there's no there's no comparison right. at the time. Right. So the four horsemen. One yes. Was, so one yeah. is leverage what you have. Yeah. Um, the first one is actually um, the uh, the challenge that uh, you can't typically you can't go into a business which has lower margins than your core business. Right, like the notion of like you're disrupting yourself by like going into a business where you know that this new business, um, say for example, you do something, you do an in-person experience, you know the future is, is digital. The digital typically has lower margins, like lower cost. You're not doing it, right? You can't cannibalize yourself. Mm. Um, it's a it, to your point. That's mostly a psychological thing, yep. uh, which of course is the dumbest thing you can possibly do because I guarantee you, someone out there, you know, like looks at this and says, "Wow, this is amazing," because I, I'm well, going it, to cannibalize. The perfect it. example is Kodak, right? It totally. was in the paper and chemicals business, and it didn't want to cannibalize that bit, that profit Absolutely. center by going into digital photography. And what they forget is. It's all about democratization. It's about mm -hmm. increasing your marketplace a hundredfold. Yeah, that's right. right. So uh, those are two already. Then yeah. the third one is um, what our friend Salim Ismail talks a lot about, which is um, the immune system response. Mm. Right. And the easiest way I can explain this in my own words is that every company is good in innovation and exploration in the beginning because you don't have anything, right? You try things out. Then you get to product market fit and then you shift into this mode of s protecting the status quo. And there's actually nothing wrong with it because you need to make money. And that's where you make money, right? By like kind of milking the cow. The challenge is as you age as an organization, you calcify. Yeah. And then you get the immune system response. And so what do you, is there a recommendation of what you recommend a company do to avoid the immune system response? Uh, it's a, so I think to a certain extent, you can't actually avoid it. I think yeah. you need to be aware of it. Um, the other thing which I find... Um, so be aware, but... Uh, I mean, I would say at a minimum, if you're going to create a new product, you know, create it outside your company. Correct. Yeah, or I I at the very least, like have different people work on it, right? So one of the one of the interesting challenges I find with, um, and this is mostly true for larger corporations, but um, every once in a while there goes this like um, wave through the organization where they're like, oh, we all need to be innovative, right? And then they uh, everybody does like a, a design thinking workshop, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird because we hire spe people into these organizations who are world champions, status quo protectors. They're really good at that. Mm. They are not innovative. And that's it, it, it's fine. We should acknowledge the fact, right? And I think there's a part where we, we put people into situations where they're actually really unhappy because we make them do stuff they're not good at. You know, so as a as a corporation, I would always recommend like figure out like who are your people who are innovators and who are your people who are status quo protectors and like understand you need both, but mm -hmm. put them into the right places. Um, and I think a lot of the pain we are going through is by trying to make everybody an innovator, um, and it just you know creates friction, a lot yeah. of friction. And then the last um, the last horseman is a little bit more nuanced, but this is um, based on uh, a combined work uh, McKinsey has done like 20-ish years ago or so, um, together with um, Geoffrey Moore actually uh, developed a framework around this, which um, we call this the time horizon fallacy. So the idea is this. Uh, this McKinsey showed that there's basically three time horizons. So time horizon one is here and now. Every company is good at that, otherwise you wouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Time horizon three is research and development 10 years out. Some companies do this very well, a lot of companies don't even engage in it, which is fine. And then there's Time Horizon 2, which is the, the no man's land, the two five year out. Right. The challenge with Time Horizon 2 is this, and let me tell you, I, I am a Time Horizon 2 person. I love being in Time Horizon 2. I've seen this play out many times. First is this, if you have a Time Horizon 2 project, it gets presented to the company, the company applies Time Horizon 1 thinking to it and the metrics, right? When will it make me a million dollars? When will you have X amount of customers? When will it be profitable? And the person in Time Horizon 2 says, I don't know. I don't know where this market goes, right? Because you don't know, like mm. it's an emerging market, right? Um, if you would have gone to Kodak and said like, when will like digital take over? You're like, I don't know. Like we can make a guess, but you know, we don't know. We just feel that it's going to be big. So a lot of the Time Horizon 2 projects die right there. They don't even get done. Mm. Then the second problem happens is, so Time Horizon 2 people get smarter, right? Like I got smarter, so you start lying. You basically go to, <laughs> I mean, you go to the Time Horizon 1 people and say, here's the business plan, right? Uh -huh. And I mean, uh, frankly, every startup person knows this because if you, as a startup person, write a business plan, of it's course. all BS, right? It's, of course. So, yeah. so you learn this, right? You're and, all optimists. Yeah, of course. And then you, then you try and survive. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and, then, and then you make optimistic assumptions that, that reinforce, I'll, I'll, just a quick aside, I was totally. with, uh, I was with um, with Elon, uh, Elon Musk at an event, and we're talking about the, the starting of Tesla. Mm -hmm. And he was 
saying how, what, a mirac what a miracle was that Tesla existed because he said, you know, in the beginning when I invested in it, I only invested in it because I was told and convinced that the batteries existed for what we needed to do and that the Lotus Esprit body would be adequate for our needs. So we'd have to develop a body, we'd have to develop batteries, and we would be able to generate cars and revenue in record time. And of course, none of that was true. <laughs> they course. had to reinvent the batteries, had to modify the body, and it was much more expensive, took much longer. And it's always the case. Mm -hmm. It's very, li you know, in, in fact, if it isn't the case, if you're, if you're being honest about the fact that something can be done quickly, you're going to try and stretch the capability or make it cheaper in order to increase the margins. 100%, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, so then the, the second challenge is that um, when you get your, your, your uh, Time Horizon 2 project off the ground, when Time Horizon 1 falls on hard times, so yeah, like economic goes down, whatever, they go to Time Horizon 2 and plunder the resources, right? Because they go and then and to, they, they, they plunder they the plunder resources, they, they, they pull yeah, them out, right? They, they right. say, you're not making money, give me the engineers back. And you kill your future. You kill your future, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so those are the, the four horsemen we identified. And again, like we see them in many, many companies play out. And the reason why we like talking about them is I believe that if you can name them, you can see them. And if you can see them, you can do something about it. But most companies we walk in, they can't even name them, mm. right? The stuff happens, it brews. It's a little bit like culture, right? It's this thing which is like it's in the ether um, and it's happening, but it's really hard for companies yep. to wrap their heads around. Yeah, so it's it literally... Uh, it's a, it's a skill, you see it when you've gone through it. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's where wisdom and experience actually mean something. That's right. All right, so let's continue on, on, this, on the infrastructure providers. Uh, so uh, let's, let's roll down some of these infrastructure companies and talk about some of the ones that you're excited about. Yeah. So uh, payroll. Uh, yeah, payroll. <laughs> so let's do back office. Uh, so you've got anything from uh, your accounting um, runs something like Zero, for example. Zero mm -hmm. uh, came on the market like well, about ten years ago. Um, gives QuickBooks a run for its money. Australian company, um, highly rated. A lot of startups run on Zero these days. And, what, and does that? Uh is there an advantage over QuickBooks that you know of? It's a really nice product. It's very nicely integrated. It's very fast. Um, it's very clean interface. And is it, is it software as a service or you yes, purchase it? Yes, software as a service. Okay. Yeah, all the stuff is software. Yeah, nothing you install these days, right? Okay. Uh, it's all the which, by the way, which, by the way, allows it to be updated and right. features being added Absolutely. and so forth. Absolutely. Okay, so that's accounting is back office. Yeah, so what accounting else? back office, uh, payroll, you know, personally, I'm a huge fan of uh, Gusto. Mm -hmm. And what, um, is, what does Gusto do? Gusto basically does your whole payroll uh, process, like literally from anything which is like all the nasty paperwork you need to do, like filing, you know, like with the state authorities here in the U.S., etc., um, to payments and so on in a beautiful interface. They're crushing it. Mm. It's an interesting company because they picked a lot of these infrastructure companies take a very specific problem and then build the very best solution. Like you could not build this in house, right? Because they're so obsessed about this one thing, which is payroll. Wow. Which is hard to. I, I'm personally, I'm hard. I find it hard to get excited about this, right? But I'm excited about using that product because it's really, really good. And and that is, uh, I think you mentioned to me, it's like five dollars per employee. Yeah, five dollars per employee. So it's, and it's it's it's, it's minimum. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. Totally. What else goes in the back office these days? Um, you had a good solution for hiring, right? Like yeah. we don't do all that much hiring, but... So, you know, one of the things I think about is hiring is like one of the most important things that you do. Mm -hmm. And if you get it wrong, uh, you're, it, it, it's not just deficiency, it is, a, it is a problem. And so there's uh, companies like HireVue that use AI to analyze video interviews to give you information about the employees and help you scan and find. So I'm, I'm super interested in, in, uh, in hiring uh, solutions. Is there anything else in the back office that comes to mind? Well, I think it, it then starts bleeding into, uh, into other areas of your business. My, of course, so first of all, of course, like uh, G Suite, right? Like Google everywhere, right? Yeah. Like you don't buy Word or Excel anymore. You just like use G Suite, it costs you about like six bucks a user or something, and you've got like the whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, and then you get into like, okay, so now how do we do payments, for example, right? And uh, there's a company called Stripe, mm -hmm. uh, which is doing phenomenally well, and they became really famous because they allow every programmer to integrate Stripe checkout with a single line of code, right? Amazing. Like literally one line of code. It's amazing. It works really, really beautiful, like stress tested by thousands upon thousands of startups in this world. So Millions. really, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, uh, you want to have an online shop, you go to Shopify, Canadian company, right? Like Canadian unicorn. By the way, what I find interesting about infrastructure is 
because these infrastructure companies have become so important to the lifeblood of m so many other companies, mm -hmm. they all become unicorns themselves. Yeah. Right. So all these companies are massive in like their valuation and their importance. So um, again, like you want to have an e-commerce store, Shopify. Shopify just has become the second largest um, commerce site, e-commerce site in uh, in the Western world. Amazing. They have overtaken eBay, uh, which is crazy, right? And it's a great product. It's like I guarantee you, if you buy something from an independent seller today, the chances are that their their uh, whole experience is done on Shopify. Hmm. And you you can tell because there's some like telltale child signs about like how the Shopify experience looks like. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Nice. It takes you like five seconds to set up, right? Amazing. And it just it literally can turn anybody into an entrepreneur. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Like. You set up your website with WordPress, you know, because it was five bucks a month or something. Right? Yep. Like you've got your website, you want to have an online store, you take that. Um, it's it's really crazy. It's like you have an idea, you can build it, you can build whatever you want, and you know, to your earlier point, in like minutes. And and it's interesting, right? Because you can also use uh, platforms like Kickstarter uh, uh, to actually get data about what people want at what mm -hmm. price point and so forth. Yep. Though there's an interesting, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a really interesting thing in Kickstarter, which is um, uh, because China has become so good and so fast at manufacturing that um, we now see people, they launch their campaign on Kickstarter. And the challenge with Kickstarter is that um, you have a 30-day time window, right, for which the, the campaign runs. Very often, particularly for, for uh, items which are easier to manufacture, mm -hmm. The Kickstarter campaign launches. By the mid of the Kickstarter campaign, you can go on Amazon and buy the same product from a Chinese Chinese manufacturer. Amazing. Yeah. So Amazing. That's the danger of like this crazy world we're living in, where like information flows so fast. I mean, one of, one of the things I remember I was on stage at, at Singular University with Stephen uh, Steve Jurvetson and with uh, uh, Astro Teller, two amazing mm -hmm. thinkers about tech, and we we're talking about intellectual property and how it will become meaningless in the future and how if you're depending on IP to protect yep. you, you're shot, yep. you're dead. Because by the time you release your product, it's been reinvented and improved by someone else yep. using AI or nanotech, whatever. Yep, I agree. Yeah. I think it's, you know, IP still matters in like some areas where you get into really uh, deep tech. Yeah. You know, where it comes like out of universities or you spend like billions of dollars developing it. Sure, uh, but uh, everything else, like totally. Agree. I'm just curious: is are there companies out there that can uh, can pro be an infrastructure uh, provider for manufacturing physical manufacturing of your product, like out of China? I mean, yeah. Uh, do you know of any? I, I oh yeah, my one of my favorite companies here is. So here's how you. This is really fascinating. So how we did. Um, Outsource manufacturing in China, pre-internet was, you mm -hmm. flew to China, you need to build up the relationships, a nightmare. Nobody could do it, right? Like only big companies can do it. Yeah. Then the internet comes along and we get Alibaba. The challenge with Alibaba is, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a, a vast sea of mediocre, mm -hmm. right? There's so many like vendors, the quality is typically not that great. Now there's a US company called Sourceify. And yeah. what Sourceify does is, they have done the most amazing thing, which is they went to China they sourced 6,000 factories for anything and everything. Huh. Like you want to make leather products, great. You want to make plastic, great. You want to make metals, great. They sourced them, they vetted them, and then they put all of them on standardized contracts. So as a, uh, as a company, I can now go on Sourceify and say, I need someone to make plastic products for me. They tell you, here's five companies we work with. Here's what their pricing looks like. Here's the standard contract you can use. So you don't need to have this like, you know, lost in translation thing. Their average order size is only $30,000 for outsourced Chinese wow. manufacturing, which wow. is crazy, right? And the average saving you have over home manufactured, meaning like manufacture in Europe or the US, 64%. That's impressive. It's crazy, right? That's impressive. And, and probably your ability to iterate rapidly is incredible. Yeah. And then think about, you know, like you combine this with, um, and of course we talk a lot about this, but you combine this with a, uh, let's say you make a plastic product. The most you do injection molding, which is the plastics manufacturing process. The most expensive part about injection molding is making the dye, which is the, the, mm -hmm. the metal piece. Yeah. You forge that out of metal, costs you $100,000. Now we 3D print these things, cost you like one one hundredth mm -hmm. of what it used to cost. Right? And easy to modify. Yeah, and you make it in 12 hours, yeah. right? So the world has become this really interesting hotbed for entrepreneurs. I'm so excited about it's, it. And it, the, the active word is speed and agility. Yep. And, and that comes, it's like what used to be your advantage is now a lead, a lead keel. Yep. 
it holds you back. It yep. doesn't allow you to, to change. And it's really how quickly can you be shed all this weight yep. and be sort of, as I like to say, surfing on top of the tsunami. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, those are amazing. Uh, what else? What else is on your list of infrastructure let me, companies? Yeah, let me give you uh, one interesting corollary to this, yeah. by the way, which is this. Um, uh, you know, you and I and uh, like everyone in the S universe gets asked a lot, of, like, you know, what do we teach kids these days, right? And the typical answer we do is, do you need to teach, teach kids the the skills which, like, a machine can't replicate, right? Like human skills, empathy, design thinking, etc. In a lot of ways, that's how we build companies these days, right? Because what you do is you're not focusing anymore on the mechanical part of building the company, like how do I run my back office, how do I manufacture? What you focus on is how do I actually create a relationship with my customers? How do I create a brand? How do I create meaning for my customer? Mm. How, do I, how do I make a customer happy, right? Empathy. Um, so it's really fascinating because in a lot of ways, like I see this parallel between, you know, like here's what we need to do in the education system to get our kids up to speed to like this new world. And here's the stuff we're actually doing in the business world. That is a beautiful analogy. Thank you for that. Hey, anyway. I, I love yeah. that. And, and it's so true. It's like, you know, mem memorizing historical facts that you can Google easily of enough. Course. Unless you love history, in which yep. case, go for it. You know, I'd rather teach a, a child storytelling and yep. empathy, yep. And they, which are, which are two-way communication yep. skills. Yep, exactly. Amazing. Beautiful. Right? Yeah, and then I mean, uh, in your infrastructure world, um, I mean, you've got like you've got also, of course, giants like Amazon, right? Amazon has more than ninety services they have made available to the world, and of course, most of us know what runs under Amazon Web Services, as in you know, like the software infrastructure. Um, but Amazon, for example, does end-to-end um, uh, -end fulfillment hmm. for product. And what I find fascinating is you can actually do end-to-end -end fulfillment with Amazon without ever selling anything on Amazon. So Amazon doesn't even care if you sell it through Amazon. They basically just say like, you want to have Amazon quality fulfillment, you know, like robotics and like pick, pack, ship, all that stuff, we'll do it for you. You want to sell on Shopify, not on Amazon, we don't care. So fascinating, right? Because Amazon obviously did was they built Amazon web capabilities for their own use. Mm -hmm. And by getting more and more people to use it, it drives their cost down because they get to use it cheaper because they amortize it over low. And so the same thing for, so anything and everything they do, yes. the more people use it, the better. Absolutely. Here's, by the way, an interesting uh, a thought experiment you can do if you happen to be in an incumbent business. And we actually do this with, with our clients when I talk to, to CEOs, is mm -hmm. you can look at your value stack and you say, well, what of the stack do I need to remove, as we talked earlier? Yeah. But sometimes you find things in your stack where you're actually really good at. Mm -hmm. And then the question becomes, can you externalize this? I give you a super crazy example. So it was uh, a little while ago, it was with a uh, beer brewing company. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, so we had this conversation. I said like, so you know, like explain to me, like what are you doing? And we talked about this and it occurred to me that they're really good at uh, producing yeast, right? Because yeast is a thing in the beer process. And if you know anything about yeast, yeast is actually pretty, you know, delicate like flour to like work with our bacteria in this case. Now, if you know anything about the synthetic biology world, we take yeast, genetically modify it, and basically turn it into a little factory. Penicillin is made out of yeast, of course. Um, so I went to them and said, like, have you ever thought about outsourcing your yeast capacity to the synthetic biology industry? Mm. And they looked at me with like huge eyes, like, what are you even talking about, right? Mm. What are you smoking, bro? Yeah. So I show them a video of yours, right? And I'm like, you should watch this, right? Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, so they get it. So they, they start getting it, and then they start making a couple calls, and now they're working with a pharma company to actually run a prototype where they use the yeast capacity they have developed for beer brewing, yep. yeast as a service. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? This is the sharing economy totally. applied to large companies. Yep. And one of the things I, I think about for companies is to say, listen, you have a set of things that are still inherent to you that you could share with startups. So I, one of the things for me is like, do you have assets, you have a brand, you have clients, you have cash, and you have mm -hmm. data, and you keep those things to yourself. But if you were to share access to your data, access to your clients, access to your cash, and so forth, you can, in fact, in think of this in the sharing economy, help foster the birth of startups that you can own a portion mm -hmm. of, minority of, yep. and have them experiment in ways that you might not otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And the good example for this is in my world is uh, you just look at Salesforce. Right, like the CRM software, salesforce.com. They have a massive, massive developer ecosystem, like literally millions of solutions, which 
the interesting thing is, and this goes into like the, the world of open innovation then, is a lot of those solutions would not been um, uh, financially feasible for them pr to produce, right? Because it's like too much work, too small a niche, niche market. They would have probably never thought about producing those, mm -hmm. right? So by, by opening yourself up and really seeing yourself much more as a platform play, like you have massive powers. Yeah, that is fascinating because <clears throat> the more people that use you, the more you find their needs, the more they find your bugs, the more you improve, mm -hmm. the lower your costs are. It's a virtuous cycle. That's right. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, Travel Bank and Brex. Those are a couple others that yeah, you mentioned. Totally. Let's talk about those. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Brex is an interesting company. Came out of uh, kind of nowhere. Uh, their story is actually fascinating. So they were part of Y Combinator, the, yeah. uh, the startup accelerator in Silicon Valley and had problems getting a credit card, right? Because foreign founders in the US, no credit history, yeah, yeah, no credit history, right? Like all the, car, the, all the banks basically said, well, you can get one, but only on a personal loan guarantee. And they're like, why would we do this, right? So they said like, screw this, like classic, like Silicon Valley style and started their own credit card. Um, they have built, like we are, we are happy customers of their company. They have built probably the best business, uh, business uh, credit card I've ever seen. Right? It's just like yeah, I mean, such a smooth I, I, experience. I know the founders and I watched them and I got yeah. into the, the funding round too late, but they just, yeah, they had like a hundred million dollar investment from Masasan at SoftBank, yeah. like a billion dollar valuation yep. like a year after they started. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And they're doing it really, really well. And then um, funny enough, through Brex, we found um, a travel provider called Travel Bank, uh, which does business travel. Um, phenomenal company, amazing customer support, like super nice interface. Uh, we do all our, and you know, like similar to you, I, I travel a lot, so we do a lot of like uh, our travel. Like we just outsource this to them and have them do all of our travel now. Um, so again, there is largely like if you look at anything in your company, like the the recommendation I have is like if you look at anything in your company and you feel like well we spent more than like I don't know like an hour's worth of time on it, just take that function. Let's say it's for example travel. Mm -hmm. Go on the internet, type travel as a service, and just see what comes up, right? Because I guarantee you, someone's doing it for you. Um, one last one that we talked about earlier is uh, Zendesk. Yes. So talk about Zendesk. Yeah, customer support, right? So again, like customer support, a lot of companies uh, know it's important. Um, they spend an enormous amount of time on it um, and, and cost and effort. And Zendesk is interesting because they started out originally as a software provider, right? So they basically gave you good customer support software where you can like ask questions and such. Um, they are now doing full service customer support where you can actually, if, you are, uh, you know, if your customer support volume increases, you can actually go to them, train them up on your product um, and they work with, with service providers where you have basically your own customer support team mm -hmm. where you don't do the customer support anymore. At least like you know, first, second level customer support and then they escalate um, only in cases where they can't solve. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like minimal cost. Also always, uh, it's never fixed cost, typically never fixed cost, right? You don't have this like, oh, we don't have anything happening in customer support, but yet we have 30 people we need to pay for. But you just pay for what you use. Amazing. And it's just, I, I cannot stress enough the magical time that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you're looking for one of these infrastructure providers and you can't find someone providing that type of infrastructure, build it. Start it. It's an opportunity. Totally. Yeah. Or yeah. if you find someone who you don't like, where you're like, oh my God, that service sucks, like build it, yeah. right? It's look for problems. They're great opportunities. Absolutely. So, Pal, this is uh, amazing and, uh, and super exciting. I, I love to go to our community for, for questions. Um, we haven't even really talked about open innovation. We're sort yeah. of talking about it around totally. it and so forth. But um, uh, so uh, let's, let's do that. Sounds and good. And I may pump in a few more questions. So, yeah. Uh, let's go to Jerem for some questions from our beloved community here. Awesome. Our first question is from Greg, and he asks, how do you recommend uh, innovating, innovative sprinting in a startup versus a large company with thousands of employees? What's the difference in a sprint between huh. those two? Interesting. Um, I think it's largely mindset and resources, to be honest. Um, so mindset being... Um, in a small company, you're typically very frugal, you're like resource limited. Um, so what you tend to do is in a sprint is you tend to be um, less process driven. Um, so if you're in a startup and you come up with like a full like agile scrum process sprint, please don't do it. Uh, you're overkilling it. Um, whereas if you're in a big company, you just need to realize that in a company you have processes, you've got structures you need to follow, etc. So you probably want to follow one of the better established um, 
methodology such, such as you know Scrum or Agile or any of the like Lean Startup or any of the other methodologies. In a startup, what I would do is I would I would try to uh, ruthlessly. We teach this to big companies as well, but it's harder to get them to do it. But in a startup, I would ruthlessly try to figure out. Um, in terms of like thinking about like a little bit like the scientific method. What is the challenge you want to tackle? What is the hypothesis you need to prove true or not true? And what is the cheapest, quickest way to get there? Um, and when you think you found it, ask yourself, is this really the cheapest and quickest way? Because I guarantee you, <laughs> you can typically like shave off a little bit of, of efficiency there. Again, we try to get this into bigger companies. Uh, they have classically the problem that uh, they've got too much money. Amazing. Yeah. Jerem, next question, please. Sure, this is from Nathan. Uh, he asks, what do you think of acquisitions as a way of innovating? Should I be purchasing companies I perceive as a threat? And what mm. best practices can he follow Great question. doing That's that? an awesome question. I'm yeah. actually curious to hear your, your I, view I, on, I on this as well. Yep. Um, you first. Yeah, please. So um, I think acquisitions are an, an incredibly powerful tool to expand your innovation portfolio. Um, the challenge with acquisition is always the integration, right? Like when you look at the stats, the pure stats show that most acquisitions fail because you have uh, integration issues. If you're a big company, you acquire a small company. Like I guarantee you, the people in the small company will die inside of your big company um, because you know, like you just suddenly throw like process at them, which they can't deal, and so on and so on. Um, so it's tricky to do right, but if you get it right, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah, I'll I'll add. So when you're buying a small company because you love them as a growth opportunity. What you really love is the team that built that. And that team joined a small company or that CEO and entrepreneur started that company because it was their dream, it was their passion, and they don't want to work for a large company. Um, and in fact, if you bring them in all the way, you're likely to actually have the majority of the team or a significant portion of that team leave and the entrepreneurial CEO leave and then you just crush the soul out of that company. So I have had friends of mine who have sold their company to a large company and people started leaving and then the company basically shut it down and then they rebought the company back and they built it back up and they sold it to another company. And this is a, a cycle that can repeat itself again. So how do you get around that? Uh, part of it is can you buy a minority of the company, mm -hmm. uh, gain access to what you want, so the ability to uh, say, listen, you own this company, it's yours, we're going to buy 20%, we're going to give you the fund, uh, and we're going to become a marketing channel for your product, or we're going to co-develop products together, but the upside is yours, the leadership is yours, we need these little few things are important to us, access to your R&D, access to whatever it might be. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really important. Do not kill the golden goose. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mary says that she's seen a lot of companies with a new C-suite title called Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, do you think that every large company should have a Chief Innovation Officer? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I find it, so in, in lots of ways I find it actually a good thing that like, we're taking this serious um, and companies invest into it. Um, my fear is always a little bit, and I've seen this play out in many companies, is when you have someone who has that title, there's a tendency for the company to believe that all the innovation happens there. Mm. And the challenge is, of course, the innovation needs to happen everywhere. The best chief innovation officers I've seen are actually disseminating the innovation work throughout the whole company. So the best ones I've seen actually have tiny teams. They force themselves to be you know, like frugal. They starve themselves in a lot of ways where they force themselves to then go into the company and make sure that the whole company innovates. Yeah. The worst ones I've seen are the ones who are like, uh, have huge budgets, have their own teams, et cetera, because then again, like you, uh, you push innovation into a corner and the rest of the company can lean back and say, well, ah, you know, we don't need to innovate because these guys are doing it, right? So, sure. Gotcha. Um, Nima asks, do you think you could see a future where companies like Apple and Amazon go under? Are they indestructible in this new economy? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so if you've ever heard me rant about Apple, um, and this is my personal view, this has nothing to do I'm with Singularity for, I'm University. I'm looking forward to this, I'm looking forward Not, to this. Nothing to do with A360. Uh, you know, I ask myself, like, quite frankly, I mean, uh, over the last 10 years, what has Apple actually done, which is really innovative, yeah. right? I mean, they've brought out the iPhone and then kind of it is it. Um, and I think it has a lot to do with the unfortunate demise of, uh, of Steve Jobs, you know, like Steve, like, leaving us. Um, he was an incredible innovator. 
um, and, and really push change forward. The same is not true for Amazon. I think Amazon, particularly under leadership, under the specific leadership of Jeff, is insanely driven. Um, and what I love about Jeff is, uh, so there's a very famous saying uh, in Silicon Valley by a gentleman called Scott Cook, who's the founder of Intuit. It's probably, in my view, one of the best CEOs we have in Silicon Valley. He said that success is a powerful thing because it makes companies uh, stupid, because, because they become you know, less and less innovative. And Apple seems to be a little bit too successful for their own good. Mm. And Jeff did this incredible thing, uh, which you might remember is like, I don't know, about a year ago, he said, I actually believe that Amazon won't be here in 20 years. And I think that he doesn't believe that. I, be, you know, I, I want to believe that he doesn't believe that actually. But by saying this, he makes sure that everybody in the company hears the message that you have to keep at it because otherwise it won't be there in 20 years. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was amazing at a shareholder making that announcement. I think it was 30 years he said that we're going to be mm. gone. And, um, and one of the interesting things, because I'm very long Google and short Apple mm -hmm. mentally because of the fact that Apple is a very closed system. Yep. And uh, I use their technology, uh, I, I love their technology, but the ability for them to always be the cutting edge of innovation is limited by their employee base versus, versus uh, going open source. Yep, 100%. I'm completely with you. Great. Next up is Robert. Uh, he says, you spoke to the future of retail being an hourglass shape. Mm -hmm. uh, which major retail companies do you think will be phased out by sleeker, leaner companies in the next 10 years? Is the future <laughs> of retail all online or do you see a spot for physical businesses? Okay, so two parts to that question. So first of all, what does disappear? Um, the simple answer to that is, I mean, I could rattle down a list of companies like, again, in the fashion industry, you've got The Gap, you've got J. Crew, J. C. Penney. In the UK, you've got Topshop, you've got Abercrombie & Fitch, you've got um, That's pretty good. Victoria's Secret. <laughs> Yeah, we studied all of them, right? <laughs> and they're all struggling because they're stuck in this middle thing. Um, and then, of course, this, the same replicates itself into other industries or other sectors, you know, like electronics and so on. Um, the, again, like what we see is specialty retail is doing really, really well, um, as well as mass retail is doing well. So uh, in fashion, Primark is doing exceptionally well. And, you know, our friends from Allbirds are doing really well. Now, the, uh, the second part to the question was, um, where, do we, where do we actually see this going and, and what do you do about this? And um, does physical retail disappear? I don't think so. I think that what happens with physical retail is actually physical retail is in some ways is growing uh, in the specialty retail. So it's really about experiences. Um, malls, like your, your standard box standard, like you know, strip mall, they're dying because there's nothing for a consumer to look for, to go to. Um, Specialty retail, which is you know, like an experience, it's combined often with like, say for example, a dining experience, um, so food experiences, et cetera, um, they are growing like crazy. So uh, I'm actually pretty bullish on specialty retail um, and experience retail. I'm, uh, I'm uh, in your language, I'm like long on those and I'm short on, uh, on malls. Let's sneak in one last question. All right, we'll end with a more fun general question from Kiera. Uh, she wants to know what books and podcasts you are reading and watching right now. <laughs> so I read everything Peter puts out. In all, in all honesty, like totally honest. Thank you. Um, I love the A360 community. I love all the videos you put out Thank there. You, buddy. Um, they're definitely one of my, my pieces of diet. Um, I actually don't read all that much books anymore. Um, I've shifted my diet much more to read um, long form blog content, um, which I find is a, is a, which by the way is ironic because we're writing a book at the moment, but <laughs> different story. Um, uh, generally speaking, so other than everything Peter puts out, um, uh, there's a thing called the Exponential View, which is a, a newsletter uh, written by Azim, which I, I love uh, and find fascinating. Oh, and written by who? Uh, Azim Azar. Okay. It's a phenomenal newsletter. It's kind of like a really good condensed uh, version. It's, it reminds me a lot to yours. Mm -hmm. um, uh, different, different area. He's much more looking at like the socioeconomic impact of mm -hmm. technology. Um, uh, Andrew Ning um, of uh, Stanford University has a thing called uh, deeplearning.ai. They've got a, a newsletter there, uh, which is very specific around the AI community, which I, uh, I love. Um, I read the standards like MIT Tech Review and, um, of course, uh, everything Singularity puts out. But um, yeah. this is kind of like my information diet. Pascal, listen, uh, an honor and a pleasure. I love who you are in my life and in the SU community. Thank you for all that you do. 
Uh, where can people follow you? And uh, and you do coaching as well yeah. for CEOs. Yeah, Talk we about do. that for one minute. Yeah, we do a bunch of stuff. So um, you can follow me. Um, uh, I, probably the, the, the two places to follow me is um, I write a newsletter which is uh, really geared towards entrepreneurs called theheretic.org. Um, where you can just it's sign the, up. The heretic. The heretic, one word, yeah. dot org. Yeah. Um, uh, where I post, you know, every couple of days I, I post like something hopefully interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it is. The other thing is uh, our, all our work uh, we put under the umbrella of an organization called Be Radical. So if you go to beradicalgroup.com. Spell that. Um, so it's B E. B E and then radical. radical. A, um, and group. then group.com. Okay. Um, this is where you find all our work. Uh, we put very similar to you. We're really huge believers in like putting our work out there. Um, so we share all our research. There's tons of videos of our stuff on there. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to find stuff. Nice. Thank you, pal. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. And uh, and those of you who are members of the SU community, I'm sure you feel like myself. It's great to see you again. Wonderful to see you. Thank you so much. Bye now. <laughs>